Hello, I'm Professor Claire Rusbridge. Welcome to my YouTube channel. And in today's video, we're going to be talking about management of intervertebral disc disease in dogs. Some of our most popular canine companions are breeds such as the Dachshund and French Bulldog that are incredibly predisposed to intervertebral disc disease. This is a very painful and sometimes very expensive disease to manage. And it's expensive because many of the dogs need to have surgical management. But do they? When do you consider surgical management? And when does non-surgical management work? That's what we're going to be discussing today. So to understand about management of disc disease, we first have to understand what the intervertebral disc is. And if you're needing a revision on that or not sure, then I commend you to look at the other video in this series, uh, which is describing the different types of intervertebral disc disease. But essentially you can think of the intervertebral disc as like a squidgy jam donut. Um, that um, provides support to the vertebral ca uh, column, allows the vertebral column to move, otherwise it would be like having a broom handle stuck up your back, and absorbs shock. And to do this, the intervertebral disc needs to be squidgy. However, the problem is that in certain dog breeds, especially breeds like the Dachshund and the French Bulldog, you get this early disc degeneration. And so the disc goes from being a jam-like filled donut to uh, something that's less able to absorb shock. And we can see this very well in this uh, lovely open access paper here, um, which shows you that the disc can start off as this sort of jelly in amongst this fibrous outer coat, which is the donut. This is the vertebral end plates here. And then in these predisposed dogs, by the time they're a year old, it has already become this mush of cottage cheese consistency that is not able to absorb shock in the same way. And these other um, uh, images show the end degeneration. So um, we can think, as I've um, said, the, the disc is a jam filled donut, mostly water, very squidgeable. It gets this early degeneration, the outer fibres uh, tear and the outer fibres on the top of the disc are the most vulnerable because they're the thinnest and uh, you get these disc contents come out and they can cause uh, varying degrees of damage to the spinal cord um, either in the neck or uh, in the thoracolumbar region and we can grade those, uh, uh, those injuries and that's quite important for communicating which ones are the worst, basically, and there's different grading uh, categories. Uh, the first is, uh, that I use anyway, is grade one for pain. So these are dogs that are uh, very uncomfortable, but they're still walking absolutely normally. Then we have grade two. So these are dogs that are still walking, but they have some weakness, which we call paresis or paraparesis. And they may or may not have spinal pain, depending on what is actually causing their injury. Grade three is when they're non-ambulatory. Uh, so they're either so weak that they can no longer stand up and take a few steps or they're actually paraplegic. And again, with or without spinal pain. Grade four is they're paraplegic and they have now developed a neurogenic bladder. So they may have urinary incontinence, dribbling urine. Again, one, um, uh, with or without spinal pain. And then the worst grade five is they're paraplegic, they have a neurogenic bladder, and they are no longer able to feel deep pain perception. And what that means is that if you apply a very painful stimulus to the dog's feet, that they are no longer aware of it because their spinal cord has been so badly damaged. And these dogs have the poorest prognosis and indeed may not even recover even with surgery, which is why I'm showing you this picture of this little dachshund here in, in, in a cart, in a dog's cart, because that can be the inevitable end um, if, if the owners want to keep going with that dog, if they're able to cope with it in a cart. So with non-surgical management, um, it's generally indicated for dogs with mild disease, so grades one to two, dogs that are painful with mild deficits. However, you may have success with higher grades. 
Um, so you needn't necessarily um, dismiss them if the dog is not able to walk. If the owners are not able to afford surgery, then it's basically worth giving it a go if you can uh, uh, manage the dog's welfare needs. Grade five cases, however, it would be better if they were referred for surgical management, if that was possible. The advantages of non-surgical management is it's comparatively inexpensive and it doesn't require specialised equipment or expertise. And the reason why we have this picture of this sad dog uh, in, a, in a cage here is because it does require some restriction of activity. So does surgery, it should be said, but um, with non-surgical management, this is usually longer. Its disadvantages, well, this has been turned on its head. I'm going to sort of talk about that in our next image. But um, we always used to say uh, at least that it had a higher rate of recurrence and there was a higher rate of the dog getting worse. There was a higher chance of the dog being left with permanent neurological deficits. And the other disadvantage is that you may not do diagnostic tests. And that um, is, is really because the, the, the tests may not be useful or they, more importantly, may consume an incredible amount of funds uh, that might be better spent, uh, for example, with physiotherapy or hydrotherapy, especially if the owner's not going to go forward or can't go forward with surgical management. I said that um, the, uh, some of these preconceptions have been turned on their head and it's really once you, you look at that data, you know, the higher rate of recurrence, the higher rate of deterioration, what you can go back to original books that say that, but you can't find the papers that actually um, say that. And it looks like it's been something that's been repeated over the years. And I can remember being told that uh, when I was training to be a vet, uh, 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 let alone a veterinary neurologist in the, uh, in the 1980s. Um, and this has really been turned on its head by uh, the group at Cambridge University because they're doing some some wonderful work uh, looking at uh, conservative management of disc disease. Uh, and I compel you to read their papers. This is this is one uh, very interesting one uh, published in the Journal of Small Animal Practice. And basically what they found was that this dog, which was which was grade five, um, so would normally be regarded as not uh, having a good prognosis unless they had an emergency surgery, they found that this dog actually improved. And the incredible thing was actually looking at the MRI scans. So this is the pictures taken from that paper. And we can see the, the um, uh, uh, disc extrusion here. This is all the extruded material. You can see it's a lot. Uh, and in fact, you can see here that this tiny rim is what's left of the spinal cord. All of this black is the disc material. This is a slice that's been taken um, through through here. Um, uh, and this is the spinal cord coming along the top there. And we can see uh, that when they repeated the imaging in this dog, and this dog was managed uh, non-surgically, then we can see actually all of this disc material is, is apparently resolved. And you may say, where has it gone? Well, some of it will be hemorrhage and that will be uh, picked up by the, uh, the dog's own immune system. And perhaps that immune system, those macrophages are mopping up disc material as well. But really this study, um, uh, which quite simply had funding to look at these dogs um, and with advanced diagnostic imaging like MRI, but didn't interfere with their management other than to give the owners guidelines for non-surgical management. Um, uh, th this is able to sort of really help us better understand what's going on with those cases that aren't surgically managed. So uh, the principle of non-surgical management is you restrict the dog. Um, and this is basically to prevent the uh, the the cottage cheese like material in in the intervertebral disc being squished out further um, because the, the more of you uh, of that material that you get coming out of the disc um, the uh, larger the compression on the spinal cord and the less likelihood that that dog is going to improve spontaneously um, uh, and also obviously restriction of movement stops um, them exacerbating the injury by getting more pain Painful. But it should be pointed out what happens. Well, it, there's no way that disc is going back in again. There's no way uh, anybody could pop that dish back in, like so many chiropractors sometimes say, push the disc back in. That's not possible.
possible. It's not a solid structure going from point A to point B. It's a burst of material. So it would be like trying to uh, put toothpaste back into a toothpaste tube for a very much smaller hole. Um, so it is the, the dog's natural healing process which repairs the spinal cord. Um, uh, so it really does depend whether or not that great big old lump of disc material goes away or not because if that's left there compressing the spinal cord as a great big old chunk then that dog will be left painful uh, uh, and with deficits so it's painful so it's very important that we give painkillers um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs opioids and the gabapentinoids and i have some videos uh, describing the use of those drugs for those not familiar. It's, impo um, it's important that if the dog is analgesed, they actually might start to feel a lot more comfortable. And that's when the restriction of movement becomes difficult. It's all very easy when the dog is so painful that they don't want to move themselves. When they become more comfortable, that's when it becomes quite a challenging uh, process. Now, if you are managing a dog which has got a neurogenic bladder, then that bladder needs to be managed. There's no point just letting it dribble out because the bladder is going to be very, very badly damaged by that. And so this bladder will either need to be expressed or have a urinary catheter placed. And we also need to think about physiotherapy for that dog. So the next question is, if you're not doing uh, uh, surgical management, should you do diagnostic imaging? And that's a difficult question because the diagnostic imaging uh, available for most general practitioners is probably radiographs and actually spinal radiographs can be very difficult to interpret. Um, and, uh, and, so, and that can be due to whatever the disease is. And that's really because the spinal cord itself doesn't show up. Um, and so we can't necessarily see uh, intervertebral discs um, we can, unless they're calcified. Now, we can very easily see these calcified intervertebral discs, but these ones aren't actually causing a problem to the dog. And actually, it's this is the site where the intervertebral disc is extruded. Um, and uh, you only know this because it's slightly narrowed and because there isn't a calcified intervertebral disc at this site. And you'd think if this dog has got such bad disease that this one can calcify, this one can calcify, this one can calcify, and this one can calcify, then it's pretty likely that one probably did as well. So this one is missing in action, so to speak. This one is also probably extruded because we cannot see that well-defined outline. We see in this, it looks like a little lozenge between the, the two vertebrae, whereas this we can see even the trail of it going up. So there is either two separate disc extrusions gone on, on at this dog in two different time points, or um, both discs have gone. The argument for doing uh, radiographs might be to rule out that the animal doesn't have a spinal tumour um, because having a, a vertebral tumour, extremely painful process, and sticking the dog in a cage for a few weeks would not be um, a, a, a good welfare scenario. But you've got to be able to interpret them and not all spinal tumours are visible. And I have to ask now, those vets that are looking at those images, how many of you have spotted the spinal tumour in this radiograph? Giving you a few moments now to have a look because you didn't know you were going to look for it. Yeah, it's here. Can we see this punched out lesion? Always when you're examining radiographs, look at the lamina. Is it disrupted? Can you see it? And look at the vertebral body. Is there any interruption to that line? It often does get a bit vague in this area. When we look at here, we can definitely see there's no line in compared to here. And then when we look underneath, we can see that this bone is more radiolucent. Well, unfortunately, this, this uh, uh, vet took these radiographs, went to the extent of making a nice study. And we know it's a nice study because there's absolutely no way you would get a neck like that so beautifully positioned with the legs back and not squint um, if you hadn't sedated, heavily sedated or anaesthetized the dog. 
Um, and uh, that's a, a very important point because doing those things, uh, making it a good study and making that anesthesia or sedation will increase the cost. But unfortunately, this, this vet went to all of that trouble but didn't uh, 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 see that lesion because it's difficult to see. It takes some training to interpret as spinal radiographs. It's not a day one skill that a vet will have coming out of uh, a vet school. Um, and these are the radiographs that I took um, when the dog was presented a couple of days later, now non-ambulatory and a great deal of pain. I suspected that was a tumour and I took these radiographs without doing any other co more complex diagnostic imaging just to show that uh, this uh, had indeed got worse. This is a pathological fracture, which means uh, a fracture through that diseased bone. Um, that dog was never going to walk again and he was euthanized as a result. So if you're taking spinal radiographs, great, that may be the only option open to you and uh, you may geographically not have any other options. Um, but just bear in mind whether the expense is likely to uh, be worthwhile. Because the one thing that the radiographs can't tell is uh, the types of disc disease which we would categorise as non-surgical. And these would be things like the hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusion, acute non-compressive nucleus pulposus extrusion, which I uh, quite often refer to as high velocity, low volume disc extrusion, and fibrocartilaginous embolism. And if those are di types of disc disease which are uh, 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 and unfamiliar to you, then again, I recommend the uh, first video in this series, which was on different types of disc disease. Now, these, um, there is no spinal cord compression. There is no surgical solution except perhaps for hydrated nucleus pulposa extrusion. And so those these dogs will be managed non-surgically. And actually, it's quite uh, nice to know it. Sometimes you can you can get an idea because it's much more common in non-contradystrophic breeds. It's usually per acute during act activity. Um, uh, these uh, couple here are non-painful after a few hours after the event. But the advantage of having the diagnosis is that you don't actually have to restrict the dogs to a crate. It's not required although it can be a practical measure because the dog may be dragging themselves around. And these dogs actually need active physiotherapy and physical therapy. So knowing that you're not going to exacerbate a disc uh, extrusion um, is, is handy to know, but not always possible because these conditions generally need uh, an MRI scan. So when do you recommend surgery? Well, this is the sort of uh, process flowchart that I will use. So if I have decided that I'm going to manage these do this dog uh, conservatively, so if it's, uh, if it's a grade one to two, then the owner will be advised for two weeks of crate restriction. Um, that means they have to carry the dog out to urinate or defecate or, or use a sling support uh, on a leash. And obviously the dog will need analgesia uh, as required. Now, at, um, following on from this, the dog is either going to improve, they're going to remain static, or they're going to deteriorate. So, if they've improved, then I will continue that crate restriction, carrying out to urinate and defecate, giving them analgesia, and hopefully the dog will uh, continue to improve. And I'll do that for a further two to four weeks. And then, uh, after that two to four week period, then we'll gradually return to function over a further four weeks. If they don't improve, then, um, then we need to consider surgical management, especially if they're painful. If they're painful, it's likely that there is a great old chunk of disc under there and really just you know, putting them in a, in a cage for a further um, uh, two to four uh, weeks is just going to delay the inevitable. Um, so if 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 surgery is an option, then we need to, to reconsider it that at that point. Um, but it might not be an option, um, in which case, well, we still have that uh, um, uh, uh, conservative line to as an option. However, if they deteriorate at any stage, then really this is when surgery is really indicated. Um, and, uh, and, and better for the dog if that's possible. And if it's not possible, then we really have to consider um, uh, whether euthanasia may be an op better option for that dog's welfare. 
So the restriction of movement should be defined because what you and the caregiver of the dog's understanding of restriction might not be quite the same. And I've had many cases where um, I've not been very precise in my in my description and the dog, is, uh, a dog owner's um, uh, understanding has been give a shorter walk rather than a whole hour's walk. So we need to uh, define that that means cons confinement to a small area or, or crate restriction. I often say to owners that yes, they can take the dog out of the crate if the dog is going to stay in a bed or for example if they are um, uh, sitting on the couch watching television and the dog is going to sit with them or in an office and the dog is going to sit uh, to sit with them um, they need to be careful how long they walk the dog when they uh, when they take the dog outside to exercise that doesn't mean just letting the dog go free in the garden sometimes people's gardens are surprisingly big um, and, the do and what the dog may do is run down the bottom of the garden chasing that fox. Um, so you, you need to keep on a lead when you take out into the garden and support their back end if necessary and perhaps even carry them out um, to that area. Um, we need to define that they don't go up and down the stairs because that's obviously putting a great deal of strain on their spine, especially if they have their little dog. No jumping. How many people listening to this are aware of uh, um, dachshunds that the first thing that they do um, when they hear someone coming to the door is immediately jump off the sofa and go running up to that door and leap up in it. All of your good work can be um, undone at that point. I've had some owners um, uh, actually disengage the, the doorbell during the dog's recovery. So uh, the converse, when do I do surgery? Well, grade five. Um, although uh, if the dog has had a spinal fracture, then the prognosis is so poor that you'll find that most neurologists will refuse to do surgery in those instances because it doesn't alter uh, the outcome to that dog. Um, grades three to four, I mean, it's generally accepted they will uh, recover quicker and with less uh, residual deficits. Again, the study in Cambridge is, is turning that on its head, but it should be said that that study in Cambridge is on Dachshunds. Unfortunately, the French Bulldog, bless them, have completely rewritten the rule book um, and uh, they are uh, much, le seems much less likely to recover after se severe spinal injury. And so if we have a grade three or four French Bulldog, then we're much more likely to recommend surgery, if that's at all possible. And some grade one or two dogs, I mean, as I've said before, it's worth trying conservative management because these are much more likely to make a functional and non-painful recovery. But some owners have, have, will opt for diagnostic imaging just to make sure that that's what we're dealing with. And, it, and if the imaging suggests a marked spinal cord compression, then many uh, uh, neurosurgeons like myself will recommend spinal cord surgery because it is much easier to do the surgery when the disc extrusion is fresh than it is when after it's been left for a while. And going back to that jam donut analogy, you know, if I squeezed out that jam from that donut and left it on the kitchen table, it would be very easy to wipe away um, uh, within about half an hour um, or um, a few hours. But if I left it for two weeks, then it's going to be solid, isn't it? Uh, solid and I probably will need to take a chisel to take it off to the off the table and that is actually sadly uh, what it can be like doing the spinal cord surgery in those chronic discs so if you're going to be operating on a on a disc it's better if it's done sooner rather than later because taking a sharp instrument underneath the spinal cord to try to hack away at that disc means that there's much more likelihood of iatrogenic which means surgeon induced damage to that spinal cord. So, as I've said before, I will also do surgery if there's a deteriorating neurological status, if, if uh, the owner is able to afford that. And if there's spinal pain that is not controlled when there's analgesia or recurs when analgesia is withdrawn. And that's uh, actually an important statement that when I uh, have them managed conservatively, I will try to withdraw that analgesia 
uh, after the uh, the second week or uh, certainly try to reduce perhaps the the number of drugs that I'm giving because I will often give polypharmacy or more than one drug for managing severe pain because if that dog is having a recurrence of pain then it really does suggest that um, there's a big old chunk of disc material under that spinal cord that that might need to have management so persistent pine, spinal pain that's not getting better even though it's grade one um, it may be because there's a very severe spinal cord or nerve root compression and if the neurological deficits are really not improving and I will not just send these dogs away for, you know, they have, say you go, go and sit in a cage for four weeks. No, these dogs need to be reassessed uh, and to make sure that they are at least making some kind of improvement. So what sort of surgeries are done? Well, uh, the very simplest type of surgery is called fenestration. It's easy, quick, relatively, uh, needs no specialised equipment other than a scalpel blade and a knowledge of anatomy. Actually, the knowledge of the anatomy is the most important thing um, and, uh, and uh, that um, will take uh, quite a lot of experience to, to know. It's meant to be prophylactic. Um, and what you do, you're basically cutting a window in the disc. So the spinal, this is meant to be showing you the anatomy of the area. So this is the vertebrae, this is the spinal cord coming uh, through here. This is the foramen, um, which is the hole uh, through which the spinal nerve will exit. And this is the uh, uh, joint between the, the um, vertebrae and the intervertebral disc is below. So in a fenestration, as the name might suggest, if you know French, um, or uh, indeed Italian, uh, you're cutting a window into here and you're supposed to be taking out the disc material through here. Now that's a very important point to make about fenestration is that the disc material in the spinal canal which has extruded will remain. You're not doing anything to that. Um, and also if you've ever done a fenestration, I challenge you, I've done hundreds and uh, thousands of fenestrations and it is very difficult to remove a great amount of disc. And you never, ever remove as much as you rem remove from the spinal canal. And in reality, I think what you're doing is you're weakening the side of that annulus and creating another path for disc material to come out of. And, and indeed, I've, I've, I've uh, operated on a dog which had a fenestration the previous day and there was a great deal of disc material that had come out through the fenestration um, site. So the majority of people who are do, doing fenestration these days used to be um, a, a very common technique, but the majority of people who are doing fenestration are doing it as part of a larger spinal surgery as a kind of prophylaxis to try to stop the disc re-extruding, more disc material coming out of the, the disc site that you're operating on, or disc material coming uh, uh, extruding out of other uh, sites. Because unfortunately, once a dog has had one disc extrusion, then if they're a Dachshund, they stand about a one in five chance of having another one in their lifetime. And if they're a French Bulldog, I'm afraid those odds go up to one in two. And so if there's anything you can do to try to stop uh, further disc extrusions, then the surgeon will do it. And you either do the traditional approach of doing all of the discs between T11, T12 and L3, L4, or you do the degenerate discs that you've identified on uh, MRI imaging. So in the thoracolumbar site, the most common surgery that is done or variations on that theme is a hemilaminectomy, usually combined with a fenestration. So in a hemilaminectomy, you make a hole into the side of the spinal canal. And this is what this is meant to, uh, to, to, um, to demonstrate. You, you make this hole um, with a drill, um, specialized drill. Um, and you usually remove most of the articular facets. That's what's remaining of the articular facet here. So the ventral articular facet. People do different things. I was always taught to make a keyhole incision. Some people make a sort of rectangular excision. I make a keyhole and extend it as necessary. Um, and then we can hopefully visualize the uh, disc material. So this is the spinal cord here. And this is disc material underneath the spinal uh, canal, uh, so, sorry, in the spinal canal underneath the spinal cord. And this allows us access so that we can pull out um, that material, which is hopefully 
uh, free. And that's where it's important to say that this is extruded disc material. So you often have to do something different for chronic disc protrusions. And again, if you're not clear on the difference between an acute disc extrusion and a chronic disc protrusion is, then again, I compel you to look at the first video in this uh, in this series. All spinal surgery is technically difficult. All of it requires specialised equipment and training. Um, and most people who do spinal surgery have had at least three years training um, to learn how to do them. Um, and um, this, uh, if they haven't done a residency, then they will have gone on many courses that involve uh, operating in a wet lab as well, which means operating on cadavers. Now, if it's the neck, you need to do a different type of surgery, usually, um, uh, because a hemilaminectomy in a neck is a little bit more technically difficult, although, again, uh, is sometimes required if the disc material is very lateral to the spinal cord, as it often is in French bulldogs. But uh, for the most part, in, uh, in uh, cervical disc disease, we do something called a ventral decompression, which means coming down from below, and sometimes that's called a ventral slot. So this is looking up at the, verte uh, at the vertebrae, um, you drill a hole through the whole of the disc and the whole of the spine uh, of the vertebral bodies right down to the bottom. So this is what you're seeing here. So this is the dog is lying on its back um, and this is the slot here. Uh, these are the muscles um, coming over the um, uh, over the, the vertebrae and uh, we're using a, these rongeurs have reached right down to the bottom of the slot and I'm pulling out um, this strand of torn um, annulus from the vertebral canal. And this was in a Doberman that had uh, caudal cervical spondylomyelopathy or Wobbler's syndrome. It's important also in the recovery phase to consider uh, physiotherapy, both in non-surgical management and in surgical management. I love to work with uh, physiotherapists and if I can I will refer to a physiotherapist. I've been very fortunate in all of the practices that I've worked in that um, uh, they have employed physiotherapists that I've been unable to work alongside because really they and the veterinary nurses are what's getting uh, the dog better. We don't want the dog to necessarily sit in a, in a cage, um, uh, especially if they've had surgery. Uh, inactivity and recumbency re results in decreased uh, joint movement and, and muscle contraction. So even if they are cage rested, um, then we need to do some exercises with them. And a physiotherapist is best at teaching those to owners. They may also want to do specialised techniques, for example, laser therapy to help uh, with uh, reducing uh, um, uh, pain postoperatively and possibly to help with uh, with with healing. Um, they'll want to give a, 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 a exercise program which starts with the very basic leg lifts um, to help imp uh, improve, improve core support uh, and uh, get those engage those core muscles um, which will then move on to more uh, complex exercises to improve core support such as using a wobble board um, or a wobble cushion. Um, Amazon thinks that they supply these for people to sit on, um, but they don't. They supply them for us to balance Dachshunds on. They will also need to have um, short walks um, with appropriate support um, uh, outside. The other thing that we can do is to refer them for hydrotherapy. So here we can see a post-operative dachshund that's making a slow recovery from a grade 5 spinal cord injury having uh, hydrotherapy. And these uh, tanks are usually the best. Um, so this is treadmill hydrotherapy um, as opposed to swimming hydrotherapy. And the reason why treadmill hydrotherapy is preferred in this instance, as we can see that this is encouraging the dog uh, to actually place uh, their limbs uh, or, uh, and adopt a walking um, posture. Whereas swimming hydrotherapy is doing just that. The dog is swimming and their legs are kind of variably dra dragging uh, behind them or perhaps motoring a little bit. Swimming hydrotherapy definitely has its place 
um, and it's it's actually great if you can have both um, both of them there. But for learning how to walk again and in, uh, and getting back that placing ability, uh, then uh, treadmill hydrotherapy is really useful. And we can see in this dog that she's much stronger on her right pelvic limb compared to her left. You can see the knuckling of the left pelvic limb. Um, however, that knuckling is okay because she's supported in the water and also by the hydrotherapist is keeping hold to her harness and her lead. So she's, ab she's able to do this without uh, falling down. Um, and uh, the, she's also able to do this without injury because if she was walking on a road with that kind of knuckling, she'd very, very quickly injure that foot. So a very useful part of recovery for any dog with a spinal injury. So I hope that's given you some insight into the decision making behind whether a dog with intervertebral disc disease is managed non-surgically or surgically. Of course, finances is always going to play a part in that because it is an expensive procedure and also geography, whether or not there's somebody able to do surgery locally is also going to play a part. However, what I'd like to say is that uh, it is worth giving non-surgical management a go because as the study in Cambridge has shown, you may have success. However, it is important to look after the welfare of that dog. And what we don't want to see is, is, is dogs uh, that are in pain or aren't having their bladder managed properly um, or getting sores because they're dragging about or getting uh, other consequences of having a severe spinal injury. We don't want to see those being mismanaged. So it's uh, it always important to keep under good veterinary care. And with that point, I'm going to say goodbye.